This is the story of Singapore Airlines Flight 368. On the 27th of June 2016, a Singapore Airlines 777 was flying from Singapore's Changi Airport to Milan. The 777 is one of the world's most popular wide-body airplanes, and it is also one of the safest. As of May 2020, more than 1,600 units have been built, but you could count on one hand the number of hull losses of the 777. So to say that the 777 was safe was an understatement. But every rule has an exception, and the 241 people on board Flight 368 were about to experience that firsthand. The flight to Milan was a long one. With them needing to spend at least 13 hours in the air, the plane had two sets of pilots. On such long flights, there's a relief crew. After a certain while, the secondary crew takes over and flies the plane, as it is very much unsafe to have one crew pilot the plane for 13 hours. I can't even type for two hours without making mistakes. The plane climbed out of Changi into the dark sky. It was a few hours past midnight. As the plane settled into its cruising altitude of 30,000 feet, the pilots noticed something strange. The left engine showed 17 units of oil, while the right engine showed only one unit of oil. A disparity like this is indicative of a much bigger problem. That wasn't all. The oil pressure on the left engine was holding steady, but the oil pressure on the right engine was all over the place, jumping between 65 and 70 psi. The oil was 10 degrees hotter on the right side as well. They scoured through the manuals that they had, but nothing matched what they were seeing on their instruments. It should be noted that at this point, all critical parameters were still in the green. At 3.04 a.m. local time, the pilot in command contacts Singapore Airlines' engineering control center via satellite radio. The pilots check with engineering to see if it was safe to continue the flight. Engineering sees that the oil pressure is still in the green and they suggest that it might be a quantity indicator that might be malfunctioning. Engineering decides to check in with technical support just to be sure. The flight flies on. Technical support agrees with engineering. They also think that it's a faulty quantity indicator. But since the plane isn't that far from Changi, they play it safe and ask the pilots to return. As the co-pilot was checking the fuel system of the plane, they noticed something strange. They were comparing the actual fuel burn to the expected fuel burn and noticed something strange. The plane was unusually efficient today. They had 600 kilograms or 1300 pounds of excess fuel than they usually would have at this point in the flight. At 3.28 a.m., the crew gets an ACARS message asking them to return to Changi. The pilot in command hops on a conference call with engineering and tech support. The pilot tells everyone else that other than the oil quantity warning, everything appeared to be normal and they decided to continue on to Milan. But they had to monitor the fuel quantities and the oil parameters extra carefully. Right as the conference call ended, the crew felt a vibration in the control column and the cockpit floor and just for a split second, they could smell something burning. They then realized that the vibration seemed to go away when they pulled back power on the right engine. Again, the pilot in command was on a conference call with engineering and tech support. They asked the crew to return. Something was wrong. They asked them to operate the right engine at idle, and then as the call was in session, they get word from the cabin letting them know that there was a burnt smell in the cabin. It's an aviator's worst nightmare. All the signs were there. They may have a fire on board. Fires are hard to control in an airplane when you're in an enclosed pressurized tube filled with fuel. If the fire burns out of control, it could sever vital control lines or weaken the airframe. Even with a lot of time, things can go south very fast as Saudia Flight 163 has shown us. Since it seemed that the right engine was the suspected source of the fire, proximity to the wing tanks would have been a source of concern for the crew. To mitigate the burn smell, the crew turned off the bleed air system. Meanwhile, flight attendants handed out wet towels to the passengers in business class where the odor was the worst. As soon as the call ended, they pulled back power on engine number one and started to descend down to 17,000 feet. They were on one engine now. It's 5.21 a.m. and the crew just got a fuel disagree warning. You get a fuel disagree warning when the totalizer and the calculated fuel disagree by 9,000 pounds or 4 tons. The totalizer fuel quantity is the fuel quantity that's on the airplane as measured by the sensors in the fuel tanks, whereas the calculated fuel quantity is obtained by subtracting the amount of fuel used from the initial amount of fuel. 
The flight computer suggests four scenarios and it suggests that they might have a fuel leak. The computers also suggest that they perform a fuel leak checklist. The totalizer tells them that they have 79 tons of fuel, but the calculated value is at 83 tons. The flight crew had to think fast. They multiplied an average fuel flow value with the duration of the flight, and that would give them a rough estimate for the fuel consumed, and the math came out to 79 tons of fuel remaining, which is what the totalizer said. They concluded that the fuel disagree warning was bogus and did not waste time with the fuel leak checklist. They thought that this supposed false warning was probably due to the crew changing the flight parameters after the start of the emergency. As Flight 368 made it back, ATC asked them if they needed assistance. Flight 368 says that they are doing fine at the moment. The crew dumped 41 tons of fuel to bring the weight down. At 6.49 am, the plane lands back at Changi Airport. The pilots break and deploy the reversers, and right after that, two loud bangs followed by two flashes of light came from the right engine. Fire services at the airport let the crew know that their right engine was on fire. They asked them to evacuate the runway as soon as possible onto taxiway E7. 50 seconds later, a fire truck was dispensing foam onto a burning engine. I'll link a video down below showing how bad the fire was. They managed to get all 242 people off the airplane. The fire had done significant damage to the airplane. The engine was literally a molten mess. The right engine seemed to be the source of all the problems, and so the investigators looked at the engine a lot closer, and they zeroed in on what they thought caused the issue, the MFOHE, or the main fuel oil heat exchanger, which I will be referring to as the heat exchanger because that's much more easier to say. The heat exchanger was a place where the fuel and oil lines came together. The heat exchanger consists of a series of tubes which is enclosed by a chamber. The fuel flows through the small tubes inside the chamber, while oil flows through the chamber itself. The oil and the fuel never come into contact with each other. The reason for this is quite interesting. Fuel in the tanks of the airplane can get really cold, especially if you're cruising at high altitude. Jet fuel contains just a little bit of water. If this water were to freeze, the ice crystals could get stuck in the engine and hinder fuel flow. But due to the heat exchanger, the fuel gets warmed up and the oil gets cooled down. It's a win-win situation. Ironically, in the case of a British Airways 777, the heat exchanger itself got clogged with ice, thereby killing both engines on final approach. They tested the heat exchanger and they found that there was a crack in one of the tubes that carried the fuel. The fuel was pumped at about 400 to 1600 psi and the oil at 100 psi. So when the tube cracked, it meant that the fuel was spilling into the oil line at a rate of about 31 pounds or 14 kilograms per minute. A bit of oil does leak out when the engine is run and it collects in a sump in the engine, but so much fuel was leaking out that a mixture of fuel and oil collected in sump A. It got so bad that fuel and oil started overflowing the sump and started pooling elsewhere in the engine. And that's not all. In the engine, fuel started to flow instead of oil. Oil was meant to lubricate the engine, and the parts in the engine were found to be dry. Fuel was flowing over them instead of oil. The collected fuel in the engine was being spun around in the booster spool cavity. This mass of fuel being spun around at high velocities is what caused the vibration. The fuel started to seep into the core of the engine, literally soaking it in fuel. But the engine wasn't on fire. It was just very, very, very full of fuel. The airflow of the plane whisked the fuel away before it could ignite. But all that changed once the plane landed. Once on the ground, the engines were put into reverse and all that airflow was suddenly gone. Suddenly, a lot of fuel came into contact with the core exhaust nozzle that had been in the jet exhaust for the past few hours. That's all it took. The fuel started to ignite. This caused the engine to stall and the engine began to spool down. The fuel that had been sloshing around the booster spool cavity now fell right into the flames. This was a situation where fuel was literally being added to the fire. But why had the heat exchanger failed? The heat exchanger is supposed to have an unlimited lifespan, meaning that it never has to be replaced. But looking back at the history of the heat exchanger, we can see a pattern. Before December of 2013, there had been nine instances where a heat exchanger had leaked. 
They repaired them, but they did not find out the reason for the leakage because they would have to tear it apart. In February of 2014, they got three more leaky heat exchangers and they decided to get to the root of the issue. They found that the tubes that carried the fuel had been crimped. Crimping is the process of applying a small pressure on the tubes to deform it just a bit so that the tubes cannot slide freely through the support holes. The manufacturer moved to a standard crimping press rather than hand tools. This eliminated the possibility of the crimps being less than perfect due to human error. The bad crimping could have put stress on the tube where the crimped tube met the support plate and over time a crack can form in the spot. In fact, in August of 2014, a small flame was seen on a 777 engine and when they tore the engine down, this is exactly what they found. In addition to that, the investigators found that when the heat exchanger was manufactured, diffusion bonding could occur when high temperatures were applied. Diffusion bonding is a process whereby similar or dissimilar metals can join under high temperature and pressure through the transfer of atoms at the interface between the metals. Crimping the tube just increased the likelihood and intensity of the fusion bond, and the fusion bond weakened the metal, making it more susceptible to cracks. So the question then becomes, why weren't the faulty heat exchangers replaced? The FAA offers a process known as Continued Airworthiness Assessment Methodologies, or CAM, to help engine manufacturers identify potential unsafe conditions associated with their products. The engine manufacturers can use the CAM to pull engines out of service and fix them. But the heat exchanger was a level 2 issue on a scale of 1 to 5, where 1 is minor and 5 is catastrophic. After the August 2014 event where they saw a small flame on a 777 engine, they issued a service bulletin to fix the issue. The fix was to be done the next time the engine was to be serviced, but the engine didn't make it to that service, now did it. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing and commenting. The YouTube algorithm really likes that. A big thank you to iTrapper for letting me use his amazing footage on my videos. Thank you, stay safe and wash your hands.